Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise Amen. Lord. Before you are seated, why don't we just open up with a word of prayer. Praying over this word, I know that the Lord wants to speak to us, and we want just the Lord to have his way. Can somebody say amen? amen. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for your goodness. I pray that you would simply use me, Father, to be your vessel and your mouthpiece this evening. In the times that we're living in, we need a word from you. In this day, we need clarity. We need authority, power. Speak to us, Lord Jesus, that we don't want to just hear your word this evening, but we want to, something to be planted deep in our soul. I pray for your people. I pray that you would help me. Lord God, and let there be a special anointing. At this moment, we love and magnify you in the precious name of Jesus. Everybody say amen. Amen, amen and you may be seated. Amen. So good to see everyone in the house of the Lord. It is a treat and a blessing to see you all. If there's one thing that we learned over this last year and a half is that the house of the Lord is a precious place. Just in case you forgot that, uh, we realize that, man, we need... Uh, to be in the house of the Lord, and we need to feel after his presence, and it's just good to see God's people uh, fellowshipping together, and of course, studying the word of God, there is nothing greater. I want to thank God for Bishop and elect lady and Lady Anna for awesome leadership that he has given us. Amen. The title that the Lord has given me this evening, it's a little... A little abstract, but sometimes this is the way the Lord speaks to me, and I pray that God uh, would even use this title to touch your heart. The title that the Lord has given me is The Sound of Your Stride. The Sound of Your Stride. And I'm going to go into a couple of our headlines uh, today. If you just do a simple internet browser search, on the word shortage, I want to show you what came up simply today. In ABC7 Eyewitness News, the, the, uh, this clipping says that prices are jumping in large part because container ships are stranded at ports and because unloaded goods are waiting for trucks, leading to mass shortages and delays that have caused a longer than expected bout of inflation. This is dealing with shipping and supply delays. If you've tried to buy something <laughs> that's not in the country recently, you have experienced some type of time delay based on that. Again, this is because there's a shortage. Also, in uh, dealing with groceries, uh, everything on the KDKA2 CBS Pittsburgh article, it says everything pulls the price up. Dr. Mendocina de Carvalho said shortage in production and a more expensive channel of supply. And we see an image of there being supply issues that are coming and that are present right now. The shortages in uh, shipping, there's shortages even in groceries right now. And also, uh, dealing with the airlines, a pilot warns Biden's vaccine mandate could have catastrophic effect on supply chain transportation system, according to the Blaze Media. And this is, again, just today. We did a simple search on shortage and what is going on right now. Also in Blaze Media, Tesla co-founder warns that automakers going all electric haven't really done the math on supply chain Crippling shortages could be on the way. If you're trying to buy a car right now, <laughs> hate to say good luck, but good luck. There's a shortage, right? right? Talking about gas, and the Hill News said there's a natural gas shortage worldwide. This isn't something I pulled up, you know, a time ago, or uh, this is this is present. This is news today, and. As we look at this as an example, we realize this is that there's a shortage on most essential and non-essential products. But we understand this, that a wise person knows how to read these trends and stores up for such a time. As we look at this, it would be wise for us to prepare for these type of natural product shortages. Some of you have and some of you are going to get ready. But the whole point here is we have a problem between 
Uh, and and I'll, I'll title this division, this, uh, this beginning part of this Bible study, The Shortage and the Steward. In Revelation 13 and 17, the Bible says that there's coming a time when no man can buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Um, there's coming a day where you're not going to be able to even work. And as we are looking at this minor product, in a sense, minor in some regards and, and, and not in others, that being that there's a shortage with these products, we understand there's coming a day in the future that the book of Revelation tells us that there's not just going to be a shortage of things, but you're not even going to be able to work unless you get the mark of the beast. So as we look at these small indications that are pointing to a day that is coming, we have to be so careful. And, and John 9 and 4 tells us, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. So in the book of Revelation, we see a major Shortage. There's going to be some major things happening at that point. We look to today's headlines and today's news, and they're just small indicators, if you will, that are pointing to a time where things are going to change very rapidly. We have to be careful. But Matthew 24, tells, uh, 24 and 43 tells us, uh, in dealing with the fact that, you know, we're not going to be able to work. Jesus says, the night's coming when no man can work. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would have not had suffered his house, everybody say his house, to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready. For in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. I'm going to continue to read to verse 51. Again, that's Matt. now we're on Matthew 24 and 45. Who then is a faithful and why, servant, whom his Lord hath made him ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Now this is talking about the evil servant. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. Now, I want you to see this word hypocrites. I really feel this is where God is driving this study, trying to get our attention as we're talking about shortages and stewardship. We have to look at the word hypocrite, and the Holy Ghost just allowed that word to leap out as he gave me this study. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wisdom reads and studies the spiritual forecast. Just as I'm using this natural example of when things are lean or, or becoming lean, there's the, the wise person says, I'm going to prepare for that day. And we understand that the most important thing for us is to spiritually prepare, yeah. to, to spiritually realize and to discern what's happening round about us and say, listen, I don't want to allow the thief to break into my house and to take that which the, the Lord told me to, to be a good steward over. And the focus for this passage for tonight's study is the hypocrite and his portion. It was the servant's job to keep the house, to watch, and simply to wait. That was his job, his responsibility. But he was judged as a hypocrite or a pretender of a wise steward or a servant. He was judged as a hypocrite or a pretender. You're acting like you're watching. You're acting like you're taking care of what the Lord gave him. And, and we have to really look into that and understand that one of the worst things we could ever do is to be a steward of the grace and the goodness of God and to act like we're managing it according to the way that he asked us and to take all the blessings from the stewardship but not to take the servanthood attitude, to not to manage what God has given us. I'm here to tell you that if you just try to pull the good out of your stewardship in Christ and you don't put in what God expects of you, you're going to find yourself in a very dangerous place. 
You know, if you're a young person and you just count on mom and daddy's blessings to, to get you through, there's going to be a day coming when if you weren't practicing good stewardship, the scripture says that that person is a hypocrite or a pretender. And if there's one thing we don't want to be in these last days, we don't want to be pretending to be servants or be pretending to be a good steward of the things that God has given us. You can act like you're a good parent, but your child will tell off on you. You could act like you're a good saint, but your testimony will show off on who you are. Because there's a coming a time when tests and trials will get the best of you. And what really is on the inside, people are going to find out. Whether you know, you know, you come to that, that cross, that, that fork in the road, and you have to make decisions. And if you're really not uh, watching, if you're not really waiting, if you're not praying about things, if you're not talking to God, if you're not seeking good counsel, you're going to make decisions that, that is going to put you in a place where you're going to say, the Lord's not coming back soon. I got so many other things to focus on. I don't need to worry about any of this stuff. And you're going to realize that one day that would be the wrong type of uh, perspective to have. And everybody say amen. amen. But it notes him and judges this person as it said that he's going to give his, uh, his point, his portion with the hypocrites. And again, as I said, one of the translations is a pretender, a hypocrite, or somebody who is acting like they are a servant. My God, in these last days, we have to be so careful that we're not playing church. We have to be so careful that we don't just know the songs, but that we're living in our private life, the life of, uh, of what God expects of us. Amen. It's a challenge to serve God. It is a challenge to hold on to the precepts of holiness and righteousness and to walk in the Holy Ghost. It is a challenge for every single one of us. But you can be honest and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, this is an area where I need to work on. But one thing I cannot do is I cannot be fake about it. I cannot confess one thing and live another. Or I can't, you know, come to church and put on a mask and then go home and it be something completely different. The Lord is getting us ready to go home with all that is happening in the world. The last thing we want to be doing is practicing hypocrisy. Let me ask you this. Can you testify to somebody that you rub shoulders with based on your testimony? Or do they not want the Jesus that you have because you don't represent him well? Because sometimes the reason we're not being a great example to people around about us because they don't want the lifestyle that we have. Right. And, and I'm not. And then there are times when you're living in righteousness and holiness, and they don't want that. But when somebody is in need and they want Jesus and they want somebody who represents Jesus, what kind of example are you? Because we could come to church and you could have all the holiness standards and you could know how, you know how to shout and dance a certain way in the house of God. But when it comes to living your everyday life, what kind of person are you and who are you? And as we look at this, we realize that God has caused us to be a steward of his things, of, of, of the kingdom things that he has placed in, 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 in to make us to make choices over. We have to be careful how, how we are conducting ourselves because Either we're going to be deemed a wise servant or we're going to be deemed an evil servant that has practiced some form of hypocrisy. And I know that nobody here is a hypocrite, but we're just warning against that spirit. Can somebody say amen? amen. So let's talk about the story portion of this Bible study. It was around 924 to 903 B.C. Jeroboam is the king of the northern division of the state of Israel. Unfortunately, Jeroboam is known for causing Israel to sin in grand fashion. The Bible tells us that Jeroboam set up Dan and Bethel as replacement cities for the expected place of worship, and that was Jerusalem. And as he built these places of worship and he directed the people there, he also erects golden calves as a symbol for Jehovah. He initiated adultery and convenience worship. You don't have to go that far. You can go to Dan. You can go to Bethel. You don't have to go to Jerusalem. Although that was the expected practice. That's what the word of God told them at 
the time. Now, he initiated these things over simple faith and obedience. So, he caused the people of Israel to sin. Needless to say, Jeroboam, King Jeroboam, was at odds with true worship and the real men of God, the prophets of God. He was at odds. But what's interesting is King Jeroboam runs into a dilemma in his life. <laughs> I'm here to tell you that. Be careful how you treat the things of God. Because there will come a crisis in your life. There's going to come a need in your life that you don't want to be at odds with truth, with honesty, with God. You, 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 do, you just don't want to be in any form of opposition against the things of the Lord. Can somebody say amen? 1 Kings 14 and 1 tells us, At that time Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. So this king's son is sick. The next verse tells us, verse 2, And Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise, I pray thee, and disguise thyself, that thou be not known to be the wife of Jeroboam. And get thee to Shiloh. Behold, there is Ahijah, the prophet. Now his son's name is Abijah. The prophet's name is Ahijah. And it's very, it's causing problems. And <laughs> trying to study these and get everything lined up. So Abijah is the prophet. Ahijah, or Ahijah is the prophet. Abijah is the son. I'm going to continue, which told me that I should be king over this people and take with thee ten loaves and crack nails and a cruise of honey and go to him. He shall tell thee what shall become of the child. <laughs> so this king that caused Israel to sin and allowed there to be a convenient form to worship that was contrary to the word of God coaxes his wife into going before the prophet Ahijah incognito. He was hoping to receive healing for his son, knowing that he had, he had directed the people away from the prophet and away from the Lord's house previously. He was telling people, you don't need to go to the house of God. You don't even need to meet with the man of God. But you can go to these places that I have set up. You can worship these golden calves that represent Jehovah. But now he's in need. <laughs> And he's like, all right, you think about it. If he really believed in what he was doing, he would have sent his child to Dan or to Bethel and to the men of God that were there and practicing the calf worship. And, and they would have been fine. But why didn't he do that? You want to know why? Because there was no power there. There's no power in convenience. There's no power in compromise. There's no power when you're spineless against the things of God. This is why we've got to stand strong and say, I don't care how inconvenient, how uncouth church is or serving God is. I've got to give him what he requires, not what's convenient for me, not what's easier. I don't want to follow the path of least resistance, but I want to follow the path of Christ. This is what I want for me. This is what I want for my family. So one of the lessons we learn is when we disrespect the creator and the restorer of life, our connecting point for help can be severed. I don't know if you've ever, to those of you who stepped away from the Lord for a while, and you ran into some major life problems. <laughs> and you realize, you know what? I haven't been giving God rightfully what's his. Well, we're thankful for the grace and the mercy of God that he allows us to get back to the place where we say, you know what, even if you neglected the house of God, if you forsook the house of God, we thank God for an opportunity to come and fall before the altar and say, Father, I have sinned before you. I have sinned before my family. Forgive me. Let me get where I need to get. Help me. Give me the strength. Lord, you know my situation. And we're so thankful that God We'll hear you in that situation, in this dispensation of grace, in this time. God is graceful. God has allowed us to at times be prodigal and come home, and we thank the Lord for that. But you see, when you're a hypocrite, that's not what you want to do. You don't want to confess your faults or your problems, but you still want the healing of God. You still want the blessings of God. You still want the overflow of God. So what was their plan? Their plan 
was to hide themselves and see if they could sneak a healing in before the man of God and through the Lord. First Kings 14 and 4 tells us, and Jeroboam wife's, excuse me, Jeroboam's wife did so and arose and went to Shiloh and came to the house of Ahijah. But Ahijah could not see, for her eyes were set by reason of his age. So the scripture tells us that the prophet was naturally blind. He couldn't see, but he was still able to spiritually discern with God's help. They thought, he can't see, he's old, he's probably losing a little bit. <laughs> let's, go, let's see if we can get our son to get a healing, to get a blessing. And he said, I want you to hide yourself, disguise yourself, so that the man of God doesn't know that, you know, you're my wife. Verse 5 tells us, and, and by the way, there's so many things that we can learn from this. Don't think that if... You may feel, whether it's age or whether it's some part of a, a person who's been called to pastor or to lead, that maybe he doesn't see or hear or understand something, that you can pull one over on him. You may be able to pull one over on the man of God, but not on God. And God, a lot of times, will talk to a man of God and say, listen, <laughs> you're going to get a call around 2.30 tonight in the morning. <laughs> And God will speak like that because it's about his kingdom. And one thing the Lord doesn't want is he doesn't want no phonies. And in, in this, we see in verse 5, And the Lord said to Ahijah, Behold, now this is the, the Lord's, you know, preparing the situation. Behold, the wife of Jeroboam cometh to ask a thing of thee for her son, for he is sick. Thus and thus shalt thou say unto her, for it shall be when she cometh in that she shall feign herself to be another woman. She's going to act like she is somebody else. So she came in disguised as another woman. She pretended to be someone she wasn't. You know, the thing about this is we don't have to pretend to be anybody else. We can just confess our faults to God. There's no fault in that. You could have you know, all kinds of issues coming up and uh, perspectives of yourself that maybe you don't like yourself, you want to be like somebody else, you emulate somebody else, or whatever it is in your life that you struggle with. It's okay if you have these issues. Just bring them to God and be honest. And say, God, I have problems with, with my identity. You know, it, it, if that's the case... God will help you and give you strength and change you. But whatever you don't want to, whatever you, you, you need to make sure that you're careful of is that you're not pretending to be somebody else because you're hiding something that's not right in your life. That's the big thing. When you partake of the perversion of the truth publicly, when you partake of the perversion of truth publicly as they did. They perverted the truth. Or when you take a stand to attack that which is right, you attack it, and then when you need true help, you're going to have to hide your malicious side and pretend to be one who is an advocate for all things God. When you attack, when you're malicious against truth, and you're mean and nasty, privately or publicly, and then all of a sudden, you run into a life crisis, and you want God's help, you could possibly sever that connection. You can possibly put yourself in a place where, you know, it, it, it's, unless you humble yourself before God, and you're still full of pride, God can't work with you. So I believe that God is speaking to us, teaching us, helping us, encouraging us, because he loves us to be honest, to be transparent. If you're bitter, if you're frustrated, if, you know, you come in this place and you hide all the things that are happening internally, there is an altar here where you can just say, God, I just need your help, but I'm tired of faking it. I'm tired of, of, of acting one way, but not even living up to this way that I'm acting. God is, is working on that part of our lives right now. Verse 6 says, and this is the part where it just spurred off the entire Bible study. And it was so when Ahijah, 
the prophet heard the sound of her feet. Everybody say the sound of her feet. As she came in at the door that he said, come in, thou wife of Jeroboam, why feignest thyself to be another? For I am sent to thee with heavy tidings. 1 Kings 14 and 9 tells us, But hast done evil above all that were before thee, for thou hast gone and made... Now he's, now he's judging. He's giving her the words for Jeroboam, her husband. He says, You've done evil worse than those who were before you. You've gone and you've made the other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger, anger, excuse me, and has cast me behind thy back. This was a judgment against Jeroboam. He's like, I set you up. I allowed you to be king, and you... I believe the Lord wants us to really consider our life sound, what we represent, what we resonate we may profess one thing, we may believe one thing, but what does your life sound like? What is the tone of your life? Proverbs 4 and 26 tells us, ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. You see, your feet determine your walk. And your feet carry your personality. Your feet carry your choices, and your walk, it has a sound. Again, you can show up, you can profess, you can confess, you can talk Jesus, you, you can say how much you love him. Oh, I love Jesus, I love having the Holy Ghost. But if you go and you're always at odds with everybody around about you, the chances are you probably don't have him on the inside. Because... It's our walk. It's our day-to-day -day life. What, what do we represent? Are we always walking in fear, worry, and anxiety? Is that the sound of our life? Uh, here's the thing. You know, we can pepper in, you know, seasons of challenge. You know, there's, there has seasons of worry, anxiety, and, and doubt that, you know, seasons. But is that the dominant sound of your life? Are you always worried about getting sick? Are you always worried about failing? Are you always worried about money? Is it, is it always about this? Or, or, or are you a greedy person or an incredibly lustful person? That that's the main thing that's always just oozing out of your personality. And that becomes the, the sound of your life. Because the Bible says that when she walked into that room... That he goes said, I hear the sound of your feet. I can't see you, but I know who you are. You're, 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 the sound of your feet are telling off on you. The Lord already warned me. The Lord already told me what you're up to. Could you, could you imagine how amazing and powerful that was? That he, other people, I'm sure, were coming and going. But there was a distinct sound that she had because she was living in so much deceit that the Lord allowed him to hear the sound of her feet, the sound of her life, the sound even of what her husband had accomplished, the evil that was in their life to the point where it was a differentiating point in her life. My God, the sound of your walk, the tone of your life. And again, the Lord loves us so much that he's trying to say, listen, I've been so good to you. I've been, uh, I, I've given you a house to steward. I've given you a family. I've given you blessings. I've given you possession. I've given you an opportunity to walk in the Holy Ghost. I've taught you end time prophecy. The Lord has given us so many good things, examples, a good house. But we have to make sure that we are a good steward with what God has given us and say, listen, I know that a part of the message is he's coming back soon and I've got to be ready. I've got to be diligent. I can't allow this world to be my focus. The evil steward said, ah, the Lord delays his coming. He began to beat the servants and he began to act in a way that, that was in opposition to his Lord. We have to realize that we have to be in the position that God has called us to be for, for this, this soon coming thing that's about to happen. Amen. I can talk to people who don't know anything about God right now and they're 
really concerned because of what's happening. Again, a good steward knows, hey, you know what? There's a shortage happening. You know, what, what did God give Joseph? Man, God gave him, he went through all kinds of stuff so that when he received that one dream about the seven years of plenty, he could prepare for the years of leanness. And because he walked with God, God gave him the interpretation of the dream. God allowed him to see the future. And because he saw the future and he held on to what God had given him, he was instrumental and he prepared for what was coming ahead. That's where we should be. We need to pray about what's happening. You know what? We missed it with COVID-19. We missed it. We should have been praying to the point where we were saying, God, let me prepare for this specific thing. But what's the next COVID-19 that we're going to have to pray about? What's the next prophetic situation that we're going to have to be ready for? I don't know, but I do know this. As long as we're close to God, we're being honest with God, we're being diligent. We don't believe that he's delaying his coming. We know he's right around the corner, and we give him our all. He's going to give us the instructions. There's going to be plenty in our lives. There's going to be what we need spiritually first, and then there will be an overflow naturally. Uh, if you're just worried about the natural stuff, then you missed it. You missed it. It's about, it's about the Spirit. It's about the Holy Ghost. It's, it's about being honest with God. It's about learning how to love God's people. It's about learning how to be patient and kind and all these things that are contrary to our nature. Amen. And you can fake it, but, but there comes a point in time when you just, you're not going to be able to fake it anymore. Matthew 5, 15 and 8 tells us, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. This is taken from Isaiah 29 and 13. So you can say it. You can look like it. <laughs> but if your heart isn't in it, it might just be lip service. Your feet are going to tell off on you. And this is what God is just trying to help us. Man, we, some of us have gone through things. Whew. If you could just write a book and tell your story, it might be a bestseller. <laughs> Man, the things that people have done to you, the, 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 the drama you have dealt with, the stuff you put up with it. <laughs> You know what? But by, by the grace of God, he allows us to stand. He gives us strength. He's merciful and he's kind. But here's the thing. You, you may profess him, but your heart has to be into it. You have to love him. You, you have to be connected to him. If you can't come to the house of God, and if you can't lift up your hands and smile, if you can't clap your hands with joy, if you can't say, Lord, I thank you with everything that is in you, maybe it's just a lip service. Maybe mom and daddy are making you come, or your husband or wife are making you. But then there are those that know what kind of messed up life that we lived or struggle with, and we just say, God, even if I fall down flat on my face and just worship you. That is what you deserve today because my heart, Lord, is to serve you. Lord, my heart is, is to give you everything that I have because I love you more than anything. You know, the, I, I would say one of the greatest challenge, the, the greatest, uh, 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 the greatest, the saddest thing I've ever, uh, think I have come across in, in understanding the people of God is when you draw from the blessings of God, but you never put in to the obligations, you never put into obedience, you never put into sacrifice, but you just want the blessings of God. And it's sad that sometimes this is all we serve him for. And I'm not going to lie, there have been seasons in my life where I focused on the prosperity, the blessings that God has for me. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, but you have to realize it's not just about that, it's, man... There's times when I can't just take of the goodness from him and, and, then, and then fuss when things don't go right for me. Have a bad attitude when stuff doesn't go my way. And you know what, this person turned on me or that person or, you know, my health or, you know, I'm struggling with this part of my life or my marriage or my finances or I lost my house or this isn't right. Guess what? This is all a part of it. 
And we have got to say, you know what? I'm going to serve God come hell or high water. I'm going to give him all that I can. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to continue to magnify him. Because that's really who makes you who you are. That's really what makes you who you are. It's not just when you're blessed and then you got a boyfriend and girlfriend and you're walking and you're serving the Lord. Man, I've seen some, seen some young people quit because their boyfriend or girlfriend quit. That's the only time you see him crying at the altar. No, I can't. I lost my boyfriend, lost my girlfriend. Oh, some of you laughing, some of you know. Oh, they're so tender before the Lord. They receive counsel at that time. But man, as soon as they find that other, you know, the other bay or whatever you call her, boo or whatever it is, they're ready again. They don't know anything about Jesus, you know. They're having fun with their boyfriend and girlfriend. It's all over social media. Praise the Lord. But when you're lonely for years and you're struggling for a while and you keep showing up to the house of God and say, Lord, I love you. I'm going to cry whether I've got somebody or I don't. I'm going to love you whether I have friends or not, Lord. You realize, guess what? That's the sound of my life. <laughs> when I come walking in, you're going to know it's me because I haven't quit. I haven't given up. I haven't thrown in the towel. And that's the sound of my life. <laughs> somebody who's praying who just walked in. Somebody who's praiser. Somebody who's a worshiper just walked into the room. You can tell the difference. My God. Hallelujah. This is a Bible study. I shouldn't get so excited. You know the story of Ananias and Sapphira where they lied to the Holy Ghost? The Acts 5 and 9 tells us, Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet <laughs> of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then she fell straight that way at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead, carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. <laughs> you see, the big problem here was there was a major move of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and they were selling what they had. And they were all giving, you know, what they had to the men of God. And some people, I'm sorry, I see you laughing. You know I see everything. <laughs> In case you don't know, I can be looking over here and I can see what this person over there is doing and just about hear them. I have a condition, and I am honest. If that light flickers back over there, I notice it. So it's okay. We should have fun in the house of God, but I, I just want to get in on what was happening up here. <laughs> but I will tell you, the problem that Ananias and Sapphira had was that they were trying to capitalize on what everybody else was doing, and they were acting like they sold everything and gave it all when they were keeping a part back, and they were acting like they were a part of the movement. That's the problem. There was such a revival happening that they acted like, ooh, we're holy like everybody else, but they were keeping a portion for them just in case this doesn't go. We want to be good. And that's how we serve the Lord sometimes. We act like, ooh, you know, I'm in revival with everybody, but, you know, on the down low, something else is happening. And that's why we have to make sure. Amen. So you lied to the Holy Ghost, guess what? The feet of your husband are already there. You can see them. Uh, not that it should be funny, but they're already exposed. <laughs> and guess what? You're going to lie at his feet too. And we just have to make sure that we are so careful that, man, this, this does have to do with our feet. It has to do with our walk. They tell off on us. Again, it doesn't matter what we say, but we have to make sure that we live what we believe. And again, if you are struggling, and if you've been a fake or a hypocrite Christian up to this point, man, today is the perfect day to say, this is done. I am tired of faking it. I'm tired of being in that place. God, give me the strength. In closing, Ecclesiastes 5 and 1 says, I must ask for the musicians, <laughs> keep thy foot. Where's the organist? Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God and be more ready to hear <laughs> than to give the sacrifice of fools for they consider not that they do evil. Man, it says keep your foot. Know where you're going when you go to the house of God. And it says be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools for they consider not what they 
that not that they do evil. Walk, watch your walk. The sound of your step should never dominate the whispers of the Lord. It is good. The sound of your step should never dominate the whispers of the Lord. Sometimes when, you know, do you have any kids that walk in the house and you're like, Lord, help me. <laughs> you wish your children were ninjas at the time or they could just, you know, kind of sneak in. But man, they just walk in. They don't care. They're slamming tables or, you know, the, 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 everything making a mess and there's just no sensitivity for anybody, especially for someone like me. who's sensitive to sound pressures. <laughs> but we can't be so clumsy and so brutish in the house of God that we are not careful enough to know. Can, can I also say this? There are times, I'm not going to say where, but there are places in the house of God where are less distracting than others. In the house of God. That you got to find that place for your <laughs> blessing and your betterment. I'm going to leave it at that. There are times when you have to be careful, you have to be strategic about how you approach the house of God, where you are, what you do. Because there's, there, there's a agility to it, there's a carefulness about it. There's, you, you know, you can't just walk in here, just, you know, Bigfoot and all, and, and think that you're going to receive from the Lord in, in, with that perspective. But you have to make sure, you know what, I have to keep my foot, I have to listen to what's happening, I have to be sensitive to what God is doing. Psalm 73 and 1 tells us, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious of the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Be careful on who you're focusing on, because you lose your footing. You lose your footing. When you see the prosperity of the wicked, they don't even go to church anymore. They're not sick. They seem to be getting blessed. They seem to have this and that. And God, look at me. I'm in a hospital room. I'm struggling with this financially. This and that's happening. You can't do that. You got to hold on to what God's given you. You know what? Don't, don't, don't let your footing slip because you see the prosperity of those who have stopped serving God. Because God's going God's to gonna come through for you in time. He'll come through for you in time. And lastly, I have one minute for this scripture. Isaiah 52 and 7, it says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publish, publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Amen. Good tidings. This is what God's encouraging us to publish as uh, our wonderful Messiah has done. And we're so thankful that the Bible says that even those that preach the gospel, God has beautified their feet. Why? Because where they go, they're taking the gospel with them. He's beautified them. And, and I'm so thankful that God has allowed us in these last days to serve him. And he's allowed us to meet certain challenges distractions and temptations because it's it's not until you meet that and you pass it with God's help that you can really appreciate who God really is I've served him most of my life but it's not until this moment right now that I have a, the appreciation I have for him because I have seen every time that I've trusted in him and, and humbled myself before him that he just blessed me and he, he revealed another side of himself and it causes me to be more thankful, more prayerful, more worshipful, more, more, more just full of praise. Why? Because I've got to know him in a better way because I've learned to trust in him and to praise him with every step that I take to the point where he's revealed more of himself to me. And I love him more today than I ever have because he has shown himself to be wonderful, amazing, uh, every good thing that you can think of. That's who Jesus is. He would stand.